we were instantly ordered to commence pipe claying our belts and to polish or clean every part of our appointments. This was considered useless hardship, for grumbling at any orders, even supposed to come from the commander of the forces, was the order of the day, and few considered that this very pipe claying and polishing most powerfully tended to restore that discipline throughout the army, which was so shamefully neglected during the march. On the morning of the 7th, we turned out at daybreak, although it rained heavily, as clean as if we had just come out of our barrack room in Colchester, and marched as orderly into position in front of Lugo as if crossing parade ground in England. Here we remained, the whole of the 7th and 8th to no purpose, for although Salt came up on the morning of the former day, he merely made one or two demonstrations to feel our strength and find out whether the whole British army were there or not and although he received a loudly affirmative answer wherever he moved, yet from the morning until the night of the 8th, the French army slept. For however active Soult was on the 7th in feeling his way along our position, by which he sacrificed nearly 400 men, on the 8th not a shot was fired, and thus Sir John Moore evidently perceived that it was not the French marshal's intention to attack until he should be joined by an overwhelming force, which he knew was fast approaching. Nothing remained then for the British general but to retire. To attack Salt, commanding a stronger force than his own, and holding a stronger position, would be preposterous. The most favourable result which could occur would be to gain a victory, which, with a second stronger force close by, would be worse than useless as it would increase the delay and, consequently, the peril. We had no hospitals, no transports for sick or wounded, no magazines, no provisions, not even spare ammunition, and not the shadow of an ally to support us. Whatever Sir John Moore's wishes as to fighting a battle at that period of the campaign might have been, it is certain that he considered a halt necessary to restore order and good conduct in the army. To this effect, the general issued a pungent order, censuring the want of discipline among the men and the neglect of those whose principal duty it was to preserve it. Having fully succeeded in restoring discipline, and in a great measure remedying the immediate wants of the army, he determined without further delay to continue his march to Karuna. The army therefore retired from Lugo at half past nine o'clock on the night of the 8th, and had we had twelve hours of tolerably clement weather, or even half that time, our march would have been comparatively prosperous. But fortune seldom favoured us. Storms of sleet, rain and wind immediately assailed us on quitting our ground. The reserve arrived without fail on the road leading to Karuna, as was previously ordered, and was the only division, as well as I recollect, who did arrive at the time appointed. The other divisions, having missed their way, wandered about the greater part of the night before they gained the road. Therefore the reserve, the proper rear guard, moved forward, but slowly, making frequent halts to await the arrival of the misled divisions. Frequent halts and slow marching between, always very detrimental to marching, was on this occasion doubly harassing to the reserve. We felt all the fatigue and anxiety of a rearguard, with most of our own troops behind us. On the approach of any number of persons we were immediately on the alert, not knowing whether to receive friends or resist foes. The night being pitch dark and rainy, this continual halting and turning round was excessively tormenting, and the men, from whom the true cause was kept concealed, grumbled much at what they termed this cockney kind of marching, to which they were not accustomed. Add to this, the General Paget gave a most positive order that no man should on any account whatever quit the ranks or get off the road, not even during any of our halts. This may appear harsh, but if the strictest discipline had not been maintained in the reserve, the army would have been exposed to imminent danger. Had the disgraceful scenes which occurred at Bembibre taken place now in the reserve, with a veteran army close at our heels and commanded by such an officer as Salt, 
the result must have been too evident to require comment. On the morning of the 9th, the wandering divisions having come up, the whole army halted for some hours in the rain, after which to our great joy the main body, with the cavalry in their front, moved on, and the reserve fell into its proper place, the rearguard. We allowed them to get as far ahead as possible, and then again felt, as we had done all through the retreat, a different corps and differently organised from the other divisions. Nor did we feel the same confidence in them, except when drawn up before the enemy, when the general character of British soldiers caused all distinctions to cease. But one of our greatest plagues was still to come. Some of the divisions in front, instead of keeping together on the road during a halt, which took place on the approach of the night of the ninth, were permitted to separate and go into buildings, and on their divisions marching off, immense numbers were left behind, so that when the reserve came up, we were halted to rouse up the stragglers. In many instances we succeeded, but generally failed. We kicked, thumped, struck with the butt-ends of the firelocks, pricked with swords and bayonets, but to little purpose. There were three or four detached buildings in which some wine was found, and which also contained a large quantity of hay. And between the effects of the wine and the inviting warmth of the hay, it was totally impossible to move the men. And here I must confess that some even of the reserve, absolutely exhausted from the exertions they used in arousing the slothful of other divisions to a sense of their duty, and not having seen anything so luxurious as this hay since the night of December 22nd, the one previous to our march from Grajal del Campo, could not resist the temptation. And in the partial absence of the officers, who were rousing up other stragglers, sat and from that sunk down probably with the intention of taking only a few minutes' repose, yet they too remained behind. The division at this time were excessively harassed and fatigued, we had formed an outlying PK for the whole army on the night of the 7th at Lugo, all the other troops being put under cover. Our occupation on the night of the 8th and the following day and night was still more harassing, and here I must say that all our losses, those fallen in action excepted, arose from our contiguity to the main body. After having used every exertion to stimulate the stragglers to move forward, we continued our march for about a mile and a half, and then took up a position, thus affording support to the stragglers and covering the army, who had previously marched into Batanzos, about three miles distant. During this disastrous march from Lugo to Batanzos, more men had fallen away from the ranks than during the whole previous part of the campaign. The destruction of several bridges was attempted, but a failure was the invariable result. On the 10th, the whole army halted. The main body remained in the town of Batanzos. The reserve maintained its position in bivouac. Directing our attention towards the stragglers as soon as day dawned, we discovered them formed in tolerably good order, resisting the French cavalry and retiring up the road to where we were in position. General Paget saw the whole affair and perceiving that they were capable of defending themselves, deemed it unnecessary to send them any support. But he declared in presence of the men, who from a natural impulse wished to move down against the cavalry, that his reason for withholding support was that he would not sacrifice the life of one good soldier who had stuck to his colours to save the whole horde of those drunken marauders who by their disgraceful conduct placed themselves at the mercy of their enemies. The stragglers by this time became formidable, and the enemy's cavalry having lost some men and seeing the reserve strongly posted, declined to follow further this newly formed levy on mass, who, true to their system, straggled up the hill to our bivouac. This affair between the stragglers and the cavalry was termed by the men the Battle of the Paniers from the following circumstance. A soldier of the 28th Regiment, Really a good man, who had the mule of Dr. Dacus, to whom he was Batman, having fallen in the rear because the animal which carried the surgeon's panniers was unable to keep up with the regiment, stopped at the houses mentioned, and, getting up before daybreak to follow the regiment. 
He was the first to discover the enemy as they advanced rather cautiously, no doubt taking the stragglers for our proper rearguard. The doctor's man shouted to the stragglers to get up and defend themselves against the French cavalry, but before they could unite into anything like a compact body, some were sabred or taken. He then gallantly took command of all those who, roused to a sense of danger, contrived a formation, until, to use his own words, he was superseded by a senior officer, a sergeant, who then assumed supreme command, upon which General Panniers, with his mule, retired up the hill to where the reserve were posted. I understand that the sergeant got a commission for his good conduct among the stragglers, but the poor Batman was neglected, a not unusual instance of sic vos non vobis in the British army. On the stragglers perceiving that they were no longer pursued by the dragoons, they showed strong inclination to straggle anew and keep aloof. But a strong piquet was now sent to meet them, not for their assistance, but to prick them forward and compel them to close upon the division. A guard was thrown across the road at the entrance to our position, through which all the stragglers must pass. Each man as he came up had his pack and haversack taken off and closely searched, and all the money found upon them, which it was fully ascertained, could have been acquired by robbery only, was collected in a heap and distributed among the men who never swerved from their colours, thus rewarding the meritorious and well-disciplined to the mortification of those who disgraced their profession. The sum thus collected amounted to a great deal, for many plunderers abandoned their ranks at an early period of the retreat, contriving to keep between the reserve and the other divisions, or keeping between the contending armies or on their flanks. But it is totally impossible to enumerate the different articles of plunder which they contrived to cram into their packs and haversacks. Brass candlesticks bent double, bundles of common knives, copper saucepans hammered into masses. Every sort of domestic utensil which could be forced into their packs were found upon them without any regard as to value or weight, and the greater number carried double the weight imposed by military regulations or necessity. On this day, upwards of 1,500 robust marauders, heavily laden with plunder, passed through the rearguard of the reserve. Those belonging to the division were of course halted, but the great body were sent under escort to Betanzos, there to be dealt with by their different corps. This night we passed in feasting, supplies of provision having been sent out from Corona, and the commissary gave our mess a canteen full of rum, some biscuits, and an extra piece of salt pork in exchange for a wax candle, which enabled him to serve out the rations and saved him from error in securing his own slight portion. We were excessively happy at the exchange, as it enabled us to entertain some friends that night, and we felt proud at furnishing the candle, which was not the less appreciated for being in the first instance sacrilegiously plundered from a church by the stragglers, then violently wrested from them by the light company, and finally returning to the purpose for which it was originally intended, and religiously expiring in throwing light on the works of the commissary. After two nights' uninterrupted repose in comfortable quarters, the main body of the army, under the immediate command of the general-in-chief, marched from Betanzos on the morning of the 11th, followed by the reserve from their bivouac at due distance, and the reserve, as usual, closely attended by Soult's advanced guard, headed by Franceschi's light cavalry. On this day they were not very pressing until after we had crossed the bridge of Betanzos. Close to this bridge, the 28th Regiment were halted to protect the engineer officer and party employed to blow it up, all the necessary preparations having, it was supposed, taken place the day previously. The desired explosion now took place by which it was confidently expected that for a short time at least we should be separated from our teasing pursuers and thus be enabled to arrive in good order before Corona. Our expectations were, however, blasted by the explosion itself, for as soon as the rubbish had fallen down and the smoke cleared away, to our great surprise and annoyance, we perceived that one half of one arch only had been destroyed, 
the other half and one of the battlements remaining firm. On witnessing the abortive result of all this labour and fuss, General Paget, who was close by, exclaimed in astonishment, What? Another abortion? And pray, sir, how do you account for this failure? The engineer officer replied that he could account for it in no other way than that the barrel of powder which effected the partial destruction had in its explosion either choked or shaken from its direction. The train leading to the second barrel, which consequently still remained whole in the undemolished part of the arch. Upon this, the general demanded to know within what period of time the disaster could be remedied. In less than twenty minutes, sir, was the engineer's reply. Very well, sir, said General Paget, and then, turning to me, he said, Go over the bridge. I considered this order to be addressed to me individually for the purpose of reconnoitering, a service in which the general had frequently employed me during the march. And taking a rapid view of the probable consequences of passing over the smouldering embers of the half-choked train, which might still revive and creep its way to the second barrel, however flattered at being selected, yet I confess I did not relish the affair. But whatever my sensations, they were my own private property. My person, I felt fully aware, belonged to my king and country. Immediately moving forward to the bridge, I found that the order to cross it was intended not for me alone. The whole light company and the grenadiers were ordered to cross over. The main road led directly forward through the town of Batanzos, but close to the end of the bridge which we now approached a branch road turned off at a right angle, winding round the base of the hill upon which Batanzos stands. At this angle, and on the side of the road next, the bridge was a large house, which intercepted the view between the bridge and the turn of the branch road, and so we got on to the wrong road by mistake. Captain Gom, General Disney's major of brigade, was sent to recall us, when we, of course, turned round, followed by the French cavalry at a short distance, within which they could easily keep, in consequence of the winding nature of the road. As soon as the grenadiers, who now led, turned the angle of the road above mentioned, they were immediately on the bridge, and, never forgetting the barrel of powder, they followed by the light company, moved in double quick time over the narrow part of the bridge, by the men called the Devil's Neck. The enemy, perceiving us in such a hurry, no doubt attributed the haste to timidity. And it may be remarked in all contending animals that as courage oozes out of one, it appears to be imbibed by its adversary. For scarcely bad, the light company passed twenty yards beyond the devil's neck when the cavalry gave a loud cheer, sure indication of a charge. I instantly gave the word, Right about turn forward. And being now in front of the men, in my anxiety to gain the narrowed part of the bridge, the devil's neck, I happened to shoot five or six yards ahead, when, the dragoons advancing close, the front ranks of the company behind me came down on the knee. I had not time to turn round, for at that moment a French officer darting in front rode full tilt at me. I cut at him, but my sword approached no nearer perhaps than his horse's nose. In fact, my little light infantry sabre was a useless weapon opposed to an immense mounted dragoon, covered horse and all with a large green cloak, which in itself formed a sufficient shield. After the failure of my attack, I held my sword horizontally over my head, awaiting the dragoon's blow, for it was far more dangerous to turn round than to stand firm. At this very critical moment, a man of the company named Oates cried out, Mr. Blakeney, we've spun him! And at the same instant the dragoon fell dead at my feet. I flew with a bound to the rear and regained the five or six paces incautiously advanced. The cavalry were now up to our bayonets, covering the whole Pontine Isthmus. This affair, trifling in itself, yet to me very interesting, did not occupy as much time as I have taken in its narration. Along the other side of the bridge, the dragoons charged forward, until they came to the edge of the chasm formed by the explosion, 
when they were of course arrested, and on the opposite side of the chasm, the grenadiers were drawn up, standing, being protected from a charge by the opening. The dragoons in the rear, not knowing the cause of the check, rode furiously forward and crowding their front ranks, who were pulling up or wheeling round, and exposed to the fire of the grenadiers, the greatest confusion ensued, while those at our side, finding all attempts at breaking through the light company fruitless, and being severely galled by the fire of the rear rank, as well as a flanking fire from some of the grenadiers, all wheeled round and galloped off at full speed. Arriving at the house near the end of the bridge, their leading squadrons wheeled short round, but the suddenness of the turn made two whilst in full speed, checked the whole column, and the light company, now free to act on their feet, poured a wicked well-directed fire into their ranks. So hot was the peppering, and so anxious were the rear squadrons to get away, that they refused the turn, and increasing their speed, rode direct into the town of Betanzos. Here we had beautiful practice, for the road was straight, and to enter the town they must pass through an archway, which caused a second check, when many were lowered from their horses. All having at length retired, I stepped forward the nearly fatal five paces, and took possession of my late fierce antagonist's green cloak, which from the inclemency of the weather was extremely useful. I long kept it as a boyish trophy, although to Oates alone belonged any merit attending the fall of its late gallant owner. Oates, seeing the dangerous predicament in which I was placed, was the only man in the front rank of the company who did not come on his knee. He was immediately behind me and remained firm on his feet to enable him to fire over my head and, waiting the proper moment and taking steady aim, sent his ball through the dragoon's head just as his sabre was about to descend upon mine. It now appeared that during the time when the two flank companies of the regiment moved forward to check the cavalry by which they ran such risk of being blown up or cut off, no progress had been made in the destruction of the standing half of the injured arch. And now the enemy, possessing themselves of the building at the end of the bridge, fired upon us from the windows. From this house they could not be driven, our guns having moved forward. Although all expectation of destroying the bridge was now relinquished, still it was absolutely necessary to prolong our halt. The whole British army were on march from Batanzos to Corona, and to have allowed the enemy to approach before the main body had crossed the bridge of El Burgo, eight or ten miles farther on, must have caused serious loss. During our halt, the French dark-brown infantry columns were seen pouring into Batanzos, which they soon occupied in considerable force. They threw out some skirmishers and showed frequent symptoms of rushing forward en masse to force the bridge, but to our great disappointment they never attempted carrying their menacing threats into execution, brought to their senses by the severe chastisement which their cavalry had received shortly before in their vain attempt to cross the bridge. A retiring army has seldom an opportunity of ascertaining the losses sustained by their pursuers. However, in this instance, they must have suffered severely, and had it not been for a drizzling rain, which continued the whole morning and caused many of the musket locks to refuse fire, few, if any, of the dragoons who charged at the bridge would have returned. We had but a few men wounded either by pistol or carbine shots, but not a man cut down. Here I must express my astonishment that, notwithstanding the impetuosity with which the dragoons rushed forward, neither man nor horse was precipitated into the stream, although closely pressed by their own ranks in the rear, and being suddenly compelled to rein up whilst in full speed on the very edge of the chasm. They, of course, had heard the explosion, but being at some distance were ignorant of the effect which it produced and, seeing us after it had taken place cross and recross the bridge, they most probably considered the attempt to destroy it a total failure, as all other similar attempts had been, and the chasm from the rubbish and the convexity of the bridge lay concealed till they were on the brink. The enemy seemed to be philosophically calculating their strength, whether of nerves or what, and of the resistance to be overcome by advancing. 
it would indeed be difficult to decide on the force necessary to win the bridge. The rifles with sure and steady aim incessantly poured their fire from the rising ground and hedges which our bank of the stream offered. The light company, 28th, kept up a deadly fire upon all who trod the bridge, immediately supported by the grenadiers. The 28th Regiment formed a barrier of steel in rear of its flank companies. The 20th, 52nd and 91st Regiments, boiling with eagerness to mingle in the fight, were scarcely restrained in their position not far above us, ready, in the event of the enemy forcing their way over the dead bodies of the 28th Regiment, to hurl to destruction all those who dared to pass the fatal bridge. General Paget was amongst us. Sir John Moore, with anxious looks, watched from the position above each individual movement. This we knew, and, knowing it, had the hero of Lodi and Arcola himself headed the opposite host, he must have been content with his own end of the bridge or have surely perished at ours. General Paget, having considered that the main body of the army had by this time got sufficiently ahead, followed with the reserve leaving the bridge without having destroyed even one arch, and scarcely had we rhetoric ten minutes when the enemy's advanced guard passed over in polite attendance, maintaining their courteous distancy, which was this day increased. Not having seen our guns at Batanzos, it is not improbable that they suspected an ambush such as had been tried at the Romantic Bridge. This, our last day's march, was the first time since Sir John Moore became commander of the forces that the whole British army marched together. Consequently, it was the most regular. Sir John Moore directed in person, every commanding officer headed his regiment, and every captain and subaltern flanked his regularly formed section. Not a man was allowed to leave the ranks until a regular halt took place for that purpose but the evil attending irregular marching was past and irreparable. Unfortunately, this soldier-like manner of marching was resorted to too late to be of much effect. We, the reserve, arrived that evening at El Burgo, a small village within four miles of Karuna. Extraordinary measures seemed to have been taken for the destruction of the bridge which there crossed the Mero. The preparations being terminated, the 28th Light Company, who still formed the rearguard, crossing over the bridge were drawn up close in its rear. Many remonstrated against our nearness, but were sneeringly assured of being more than safe. Thus, high-bred scientific theory scorned the vulgarity of common sense. The explosion at length took place and completely destroyed two arches. Large blocks of masonry whizzed awfully over our heads and caused what the whole of Salt's cavalry could not effect during the retreat. The light company of the 28th and Captain Cameron's company of the 95th broke their ranks and ran like turkeys, and regardless of their bodies crammed their heads into any hole which promised security. The upshot Masonic masses continuing their parabolic courses passed far to our rear, and, becoming independent of the impetus by which they had been disturbed, descended and were deeply buried in the earth. One man of the 28th was killed, and four others severely wounded were sent that night into Karuna. This was the only bridge destroyed during the whole retreat, except that of Castro Gonzolo, although many were attempted. Headquarters were this night at Karuna, and the whole of the troops under cover. Even the 28th Light Company, although on guard over that wonder, the blown-up bridge, were sheltered. We occupied a house quite close to the end of the bridge. At nearly opposite to us on the other side of the street, a company of the 95th were stationed, also in a house, and each company threw out small detached parties and sentinels along the bank of the river. The French infantry did not come up that evening, but next morning, as day broke, we discovered the opposite bank lined by their light troops, and a small village not far distant was held in force. But a few shots from our guns obliged the enemy to abandon the post, and a sentry from the 95th was pushed forward to the verge of the broken arch, screened by stones and rubbish. 
our opponents took up a similar post on their side during the night, so that, the British troops having now turned round to face the enemy, the advanced posts of the contending armies were only the breadth of two arches of a bridge asunder. In this situation, we continued for two days, keeping up an incessant fire so long as we could discover objects to fire at. This continued blaze was to our advantage, as it obliged the enemy to answer us. We were plentifully supplied with fresh ammunition from Corona, whereas the expenditure on the part of our foes was not so easily remedied. This they afterwards felt at the Battle of Corona. The Light Company were very critically situated. On one side our windows were exposed to a flanking fire. At the end of the house they were directly open to the enemy, and both were exposed to fire from the opposite bank, which was hotly maintained, so that it was impossible to cross the room we occupied except by creeping on our hands and knees. But in one angle we were as secure as in a coffee house in London. We could have been altogether out of danger in a magazine underneath, but from there we could not see what the enemy were about, and every moment it was expected they would attempt to repair the bridge, or in some way endeavour to cross the river, which was found to be fordable at low water. We therefore placed a large table, the only one found in the house, in the safety corner. A magazine was discovered filled with potatoes, the only ones we saw since leaving Salamanca, and some fowls, detected in an outhouse, were cackled forth from their hiding places by the melodious, though perfidious, notes of the ventriloquists in their search for game. Having a sumptuous dinner on this day, we invited Captain Cameron, commanding the Highland Company of the 95th, who were on piquet in the house opposite, to come over and dine with us. Cameron was an excellent fellow and a gallant and determined soldier. He willingly accepted the invitation, but hesitated as to crossing the street, not thinking himself justified in risking his life for a dinner when employed upon duty so important. But I told him that if he would wait until three shots had been fired at the window, from which I was speaking, but standing at a respectful distance from it, he would be safe in running across the street. I then put my cap upon the point of my sword, pushing it gradually out of the window, at the same time cautiously, as it were, moving forward a musket. The three shots were soon fired at the cap. Cameron then bolted across the street, but just as he was entering the door, a fourth shot was fired, which I did not expect, and, as well as I can remember, passed through the skirts of his greatcoat without doing any other injury. The danger was not here finished, for as soon as he arrived within three steps of the top of the stairs, he was obliged to crawl on all fours and continue that grovelling movement until he arrived within the Sanctum Sanctorum. The servant who brought in dinner was obliged to conform to the same quadruped movement, pushing the dishes on before him. On that day also, Lieutenant Hill of our regiment came to visit us, passing along the rear of the houses. We were now rather numerous in the safe corner, being four in number, Cameron, Hill, Taylor and myself. Hill, who came in late, was warned to keep within due bounds, yet in a moment of forgetfulness he placed his glass outside the safety line and, as luck would have it, just as he withdrew his hand the glass was shattered to pieces by a musket shot. A loud laugh arose at his expense. There was no other glass to be found and each being unwilling to lend his, he drank sometimes out of one and sometimes out of another. The scene was truly ridiculous, and the manner also in which we discovered wine is not unworthy of being noticed. A man of the company, named Savage, came running to say that he had discovered wine, and conducted me to a house close by, in which General Disney, who commanded our brigade, was quartered. Looking through a crevice pointed out by Savage, for whose continued laughter I could not account, as soon as my eye became familiar with the dim light within, I discovered the general and his aide-de-camp, Captain Dioli, of the guards, filling their canteens with wine. Rather at a loss, and not thinking it decorous to interrupt the general, whilst officially employed for the good of the service, I went round to the door, which I discovered whilst peeping through the microscopic fissure.
Here I waited until they came out, not badly provisioned with not bad wine. Just as they were about to lock the door, I sprang forward, saying that I had discovered wine to be in the house, and came to inform him. The general thanked me very politely, saying that he intended acquainting me privately, but that great caution must be observed to keep it a profound secret from the men. This was the good of the service alluded to. The general then gave me the key. We sent for our canteens, which for several days had hung uselessly over the men's shoulders. Our mess was plentifully stocked, and we gave every man a bottle of wine half at a time. Shortly afterwards, Doily came with the general's compliments to ask if I could lend him a piece of salt pork which he promised to repay at Karuna. Our mess had none to give, but I procured a four-pound piece from the company, which I must say he has never recollected to repay, so that should he ever meet the 28th Light Company, he will have an opportunity of fulfilling his obligations. On the evening of the 13th, the reserve received an order to evacuate El Burgo immediately. It stated that no regular formation whatever was to take place, neither regiments, companies, nor sections. Every man was to move out independently, and as soon as possible, in the direction of Corona. The light company of the 28th were directed to retire in the same manner as soon as the place should be evacuated by the whole of the reserve. Such an order coming from General Paget astonished us all. But our speculations ceased when we reflected upon the source whence the order emanated. For such was the high estimation entertained of General Paget, and such the confidence reposed in him by every officer and man in the reserve, that any orders coming from him were always received as the result of cool determination and mature judgment. When that officer gave an order, there was something so peculiar in his glance, so impressive in his tone of voice, and so decisive in his manner, that no one held commune, even with himself, as to its propriety or final object. The order was clear, the execution must be prompt. In obedience to this order, the reserve commenced moving out of the town, directing their steps towards Karuna in the manner indicated. The light company perceiving the village evacuated by all except themselves, prepared to follow the example by moving out of the hothouse which they had occupied for two days, when all of a sudden we were not a little startled by a tremendous crash. A cannon shot, followed by another and another, passed through the roof, shattering tiles, beams, and every article that opposed. Our sanctum sanctorum or safety corner now became no longer such. We hurried downstairs, not delaying to assume our accustomed quadruped position. This was the first time the enemy brought artillery to bear on the rearguard, although their guns were in position at Lugo. The previous unaccountable order was now fully explained. General Paget had discovered a partially masked battery in forwardness on the summit of a hill, and the whole village was entirely exposed to its fire. Into this battery, the enemy were dragging their guns, while the reserve were evacuating El Burgo. The general, perceiving the place no longer tenable, fortunately ordered it to be abandoned in the manner mentioned. Had he waited to make regular formations, the loss of men on our part must have been considerable, for as the light company passed through, the whole village was under cannonade and the streets raked by musketry from the bridge. Thus the reserve bade adieu to the advanced guard of Marshal Salt's army as an advanced guard. They insulted us at parting by firing while we were withdrawing our advanced sentries, pressing necessity preventing us from resenting the affront. But we warned them to beware, should we meet again. And now, before I join the army at Karuna, I beg to make a few remarks about the Light Company, 28th Regiment, during the retreat which ended at El Burgo. It must, I imagine, appear evident from the narrative that this company fully participated in all the fatigues, hardships, and privations which occurred throughout the campaign in question. That they, in common with the reserve, traversed eighty miles of ground in two marches, passed several nights under arms among the snow-covered mountains, 
covered the army as a piquet at Lugo, Betanzos and Coruna, at which the reserve were for two days in continual fire. That scarcely a shot was fired during the campaign at which the company were not present, nor a skirmish in which they did not bear a part. And it must be clear, from the nature of light troops' duty and movements, that they took as much exercise and passed over as much ground as the most actively employed part of the army. From there being exclusively charged twice by the enemy's cavalry at Calcabellos, once furiously charged at the bridge of Betanzos, and as the rearmost company of the rearguard on January 5th engaged from morning until night along the road from Nogales to Constantino, it is but reasonable to suppose that they must have suffered at least as many casualties as any company of the army. And finally, they marched, the last company of the whole army, through the village of El Burgo, under a heavy cannonade and a sharp fire of musketry. Yet it now fell in as strong, if not the strongest company present, and as efficient, willing and ready for fight as any which the army could produce. And were I to give my testimony in presence of the most solemn tribunal, I could not say, so far as my memory serves, that a single individual of that company fell out of the ranks, or was left behind, in consequence of intolerable fatigue. The captain of the company, Bradby, was left behind, sick, at Lisbon, and the senior lieutenant, English, was sent in the sick carts from Benevente to Coruna on December 27, 1808, suffering from dysentery. But no man fell out on the march. This short statement is not given with a motive of extolling the service of the company or of proclaiming their strict discipline, though that would only be performing an act of justice towards the distinguished corps of which the company formed a part. I mention it rather as forming in my humble opinion a strong feature in the character of the whole retreat. In bringing the 28th Light Company so frequently into contact with the enemy, on which occasions the regiment were always at hand, I will not assert that some little predilection may not have been entertained by General Paget. I use the term predilection rather than confidence, lest such term might be considered unpleasing to the other gallant corps who formed the reserve, but whatever be the term used, the inclination was most natural. General Paget had commanded the 28th Regiment and had left it but a few years previous to the campaign now under notice. Consequently, he knew many of the men and was acquainted with all the old officers. He commanded the regiment too in a situation which put nerve and discipline to the severest trial which has ever been recorded. He it was who, when in command of the 28th Regiment in Egypt and attacked front and rear at the same moment, ordered the rear rank to face about and in this situation, novel in warfare, received the double charge which the men firmly resisted and victoriously repulsed. Thus he put to flight that chosen body who, previous to this extraordinary circumstance, were termed the French Invincibles. It cannot then be wondered at, nor can any other regiment feel jealous, that General Paget wished in the hour of trial to have his old corps near his person, not for his protection, but because wherever the enemy made their boldest attacks in the vain hope of reviving their claim to invincibility, there was he to be found triumphantly disputing such claim, confident of success when at the head of the same corps with whom he had destroyed their original title, a title which after many a gallant effort made in its support expired on March 21st, 1801, on the bayonets of the old slashers, on the evening of the 13th, the reserve fell into position with the army at Coruna, but still there was no appearance of the transports. On this night, the enemy, by indefatigable labour, put the bridge of El Burgo in a passable state. And early on the morning of the 14th, they crossed over two divisions of infantry and one of cavalry. As it was impossible to prevent this movement, it was feebly opposed with the object of economising our strength for a more serious event. However, some gunshots were exchanged. On this morning, a large quantity of powder sent for the use of the Spaniards was destroyed to prevent its falling into the hands of the enemy. 
The casks were piled up in a large and lesser magazine, built together upon a hill about three miles from the town. The smaller one blew up with a terrible noise, which startled us all. But scarcely had we attempted to account for the occurrence when, the train igniting the larger one, the crash was dreadful. A panic seized all. The earth was agitated for miles, and almost every window in Karuna was shattered. This was the largest explosion of powder which had ever taken place in Europe, 4,000 barrels. On this evening, the long-expected transports hove in sight and soon entered the harbour of Karuna. Preparations for embarkation immediately commenced, and during the night, the sick, the best horses and upwards of fifty pieces of artillery were put on board ready for a start, but eight or ten Spanish guns were kept on shore, ready for a fight. On the 15th, Laborde's division arrived, a formidable reinforcement, and immediately fell into position on the extreme right of the enemy's line. The despondency which seized the minds of many at the long delay of the transports, and the accumulating strength of the enemy which increased the danger of embarkation, induced several general officers to recommend to the commander of the forces that he should ask the French marshal for terms under which he might retire to his transports without molestation. Few men of sound reflection could imagine that, even should the commander of the forces crouch to this humiliating proposition, it would be acceded to by the haughty French marshal. Besides, there was no necessity for the degrading step. The enemy, it is true, had upwards of 20,000 men in a strong position, and we had about 14,000 men in an inferior position, the only one left us to occupy. But the inhabitants of Karuna were determined to stand by us to the last and in a great measure cover our embarkation. And once embarked, we were not in very great danger, for all the batteries on the sea face had been dismantled. Another great advantage was that every English soldier was furnished with a new firelock and his pouch filled with fresh ammunition, ready to be replenished from Karuna when required. These advantages compensated for more than half the difference in our numerical strength. Above all, Sir John Moore was not a man who would recommend a British soldier to petition on his knees to an enemy, or to lower his national high bearing. The high-spirited Moore was the last general in His Majesty's service who would submissively lead a gallant British force, however small, through the Cordine Forks. He rejected the ignoble proposition with feelings such as it deserved. The conduct of the inhabitants of Karuna was doubly honourable, as they knew that in a very few days their town must fall into the hands of the enemy, whom they were now so strenuously opposing. On the evening of the 15th, a smart skirmish took place between our piquets on the left and a party sent forward on the French right, in the neighbourhood of Palavia Abaxo. Laborde sent forward two guns to strengthen his party. Lieutenant Colonel Mackenzie, of the 5th, with some companies rushed forward, endeavouring to seize the battery. But a strong line of infantry who lay concealed behind some walls started up and poured in such a sharp fire that the piquets were driven back, carrying their lieutenant colonel mortally wounded. During the night of the 15th, Soult completed his arrangements. His right rested close to the Mero, and prolonging his line over rocky and woody ground, he placed his left close to a rocky eminence, upon which he planted his principal battery, consisting of eleven guns, posting several other guns as vantage ground offered along his line. To the left, and in advance of this big battery, their cavalry were drawn up. Franceschi's dragoons on their extreme left were nearly a mile in rear of General Baird's division in a diagonal direction. The rocky eminence which sustained the great French battery stood at the edge of a valley which lay on Baird's right, extending in a semicircular direction by his rear and not far distant from the harbour of Karuna.
However, we were soon gratified by seeing the whole British army in position about three miles in front of Lugo.